Miss Osborne's pleasure was so mixed with astonishment that he pulled out Osborne's note and thrust it toward her as evidence. Look at this, he said triumphantly. This is your husband's letter for you. She took the precious piece of paper and devoured its contents. Tears welled up in her eyes as she finished. After she had composed herself, Fuchida asked, Can we have two overnights in your house? She gladly agreed. They then unloaded rations that Fuchida had unblushingly stolen from the Japanese Navy. This is our food. You may cook from it, he said. Knowing that she wanted to be alone to savour her husband's first letter in so many long, unhappy months, he led the men back to the plane to begin their survey. Thinking the little girl might like to fly with them, he looked around for her. At first he couldn't find her, then a rustling in the tree sheltering the house attracted his attention. High up, the child swung through the branches with the unstudied grace of a small jungle creature. Surprised and amused by her agility, Fuchida called up to her, Oh, you're a little white monkey! She was so obviously enjoying herself that he abandoned the idea of taking her along and set off to work. For two days they surveyed the area. Fuchida was glad the young lieutenant had come along, for he was skilled in such matters. On both days, Miss Osborne served a substantial dinner and breakfast from the rations, and the men enjoyed two evenings in the congenial atmosphere of the old Spanish house. As the second evening dwindled into night, Fuchida said to Miss Osborne, Tomorrow we must return to Davao. If you'd like to write your husband a letter, I'll deliver it for you. Eagerly she penned one, as did her daughter and the two faithful servants who had sheltered them in their hour of need. When the time came to part after breakfast the next morning, Fuchida told Miss Osborne that the remaining rations were for her. We will leave this food for you in thanks. With that, they took off and again circled the house a few times in farewell. The four people on the ground waved until Fuchida lost sight of them in the distance. The Osborne episode, a curiously idyllic interlude of peace amid the tumult of war, was impressed indelibly on Fuchida's mind. It had been an entirely new experience. He had known many kinds of joy. The warm, homely pleasures of a husband and father, the dedication and comradeship that came of serving his country. At Cagayan, he felt the quiet glow of bringing happiness to distressed fellow creatures. Many years later, he encountered the little white monkey again, and learned that in her family the name of Mitsuo Fuchida had been gratefully honoured. His work at Davao completed, Fuchida and his two colleagues flew almost due east to the Palau Islands, where, after his usual investigation, he ordered three runways remodelled at Peleliu. From there he moved northwest to Yap, that perennial bone of Japanese-American contention. The next step on his swing was Saipan. There he ran into Nagumo. The Admiral was winding up a brief tour of duty as commander of Kura Naval Base, and early in the spring would become commander concurrently of the Middle Pacific Area Fleet and of the 14th Air Fleet. Thus he would be responsible for Japan's naval forces in the Marianas and Carolines, as well as for the defence of these islands. They represented the last line in the Pacific before the homeland itself, a fact of which Nagumo was acutely aware. Fuchida had not seen Nagumo since the sad voyage back from Midway. The Admiral was his old, kindly self, but worry shadowed his mind. He had every reason for concern. My Central Pacific forces will be inadequate for their task, being mostly anti-submarine craft with a sprinkling of combat planes, he told Fuchida. They have been promised troop transfers from Manchuria, but they won't be under my command. How can I defend all these islands with the forces at my disposal? I want the first air fleet placed under me as a strong force I can depend upon. Fushida tried to explain the current organisation, mission and command woolly channels of the new first air fleet. In case of necessity, the fleet will come to the Marianas or anywhere else that it is needed, he concluded. But Nagumo had trouble with this concept. He was too stupid to understand the new situation, Fuchida snapped later, with a brutality born of impatience. No doubt the Admiral had an uneasy feeling that somewhere along the line he would be left holding the bag. This new mobile organisation couldn't be in more than once place at a time. Suppose Nagumo needed it at the same moment another commander wanted it somewhere else. What assurance had he that his would be the heeded call? He had a solid precedent to mull over. The way the high echelon had mishandled the old main body under Yamamoto, 
hoarding it for some nebulous future emergency when real emergency was already upon the Navy. After his talk with Nagumo, Fuchida moved on to Tinian and Guam. As a result of this survey, he asked Nagumo to build a total of ten airbases on the islands of Saipan, Tinian, Guam and Rota. This completed his work in the Marianas. Fuchida returned to Yokosuka, feeling that he had left behind him a sorely unhappy man. After settling his gear at Yokosuka, he went to General Staff Headquarters in Tokyo to report to gender. With him, Fuchida found another friend whose career had paralleled his since Etajima, Commander Ejiro Suzuki, now in charge of air maintenance on the Naval General Staff. Both men carefully evaluated Fuchida's lengthy report and approved his recommendations, which totaled 15 new air bases in the Philippines and 10 in the Marianas. Fuchida subsided into routine duties at Kanoya. The autumn and winter of 1943 were busy months for the Navy, but he was not directly concerned with any of the action at sea. He remained tied up training the men of the first air fleet to be worthy successors of the original force. As fate would have it, they saw action considerably sooner than he expected or desired. On 20 November, US forces invaded the Gilberts and after savage fighting took over Tarawa and Makin Atolls. Having an essential base for air support and using fast carrier strikes against the marshals, the Americans next occupied Kwajalein and Majuro beginning on 31st January 1944. Kwajalein had been Japan's main naval base in the area. No Japanese were on Majuro, but it became an exceedingly useful base for the Americans. By these quick, powerful thrusts, the United States secured communications with the South and Southwest and began a series of amphibious operations aimed ultimately at the invasion of Japan itself. From this time forth, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz held the strategic initiative to which the Japanese Navy had to respond. The American drive into the Marshalls and a reconnaissance aircraft hovering inquisitively over Truk in the heart of the Carolines convinced Koga that this area was no longer a safe haven, if indeed it had ever been. He decided to get his major ships out of there while the getting was good. He dispatched Ozawa with his carriers to Singapore and Kurita's second fleet to Palau. Then on the 4th of February, Koga sailed his flagship Musashi to Tokyo for a conference on top-level strategy. There he urged the naval general staff that Japan must establish the last defence line in the Mariana Island, the Western Carolines. If Koga believed his own precepts as expounded to his chief of staff, Fukudome, he had reached that conclusion before February 1944. Like Yamamoto, he thought that the combined fleet must fight a decisive battle with the US Pacific Fleet. Koga had little carrier strength left, but he hoped that such an engagement might take place near the Marshalls, where he could count upon Japan's land-based air strength. If the battle did not take place in 1943, it would no longer be possible to fight on the Marshalls line. In that event, Japanese forces would continually be forced back. Nimitz failed to oblige Koga with the statutory Great All-Out Battle. Moreover, the US. Pacific Fleet, plus Army and Marine units, were methodically penetrating the Marshalls. Hence, late 1943 was for the Japanese what Fukudome gloomily called a transition period in which operations were changed to suicide warfare without a chance of success. At first, the Naval General Staff balked at turning the first air fleet over to Koga, being reluctant to commit the force before it was fully trained. But while Koga was thus conferring in Tokyo, Vice Admiral Raymond A. Spruance's carriers, under Rear Admiral Mark A. Mitcher, hit Truk on 17 and 18 February 1944. The severity of these attacks underlined Koga's arguments more thoroughly than any line of reasoning could have done, and persuaded Tokyo to let him have the first air fleet. The invasion of the marshals and the raid on Truk also convinced the High Command that Koga was right, that they could expect the full force of an all-out American offensive. They had to hold the Marianas and Carolines. Koga sailed the Musashi from Tokyo to Palau, about 1,200 miles west of Truk, where he established combined fleet headquarters. As Koga plunged through the Pacific to join Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita, he hoped that the Americans would have to pause and consolidate their gains. In case they didn't, Koga had an alternate plan. If they struck shortly against the Marianas, Koga would move his headquarters to Saipan. If they hit in the south, he would move to Davao and command from there. 
Fuchida heard about the truck raid while busy with his training tasks at Kanoya. He didn't know the full extent of the damage, but he learned enough to reach a swift conclusion. Nimitz would invade the Marianas much sooner than the Japanese expected. Thus, it behooved the Navy to lose no time in preparing for the forthcoming trial of strength. In particular, they must redouble their efforts to perfect the first air fleet. Fuchida was dumbfounded to learn of Koga's success in securing that organization. He understood why Koga wanted it, and didn't accuse him of stupidity as he had Nagumo. Fukudome negotiated the transfer. However, in Yamamoto's time, the general staff had established the dangerous precedent of knuckling under to the commander-in-chief of the combined feat. They would have given in to Koga had they understood the reasoning behind the present organization of the air fleet, Fuchida thought. He recalled vividly his post, Pearl Harbor encounter with Fukudome about breaking up the Nagumo task force. News of the impending transfer sent Fuchida post-haste to Kakuta to protest. Our training mission has been seriously delayed by lack of planes, he reminded his chief. We need at least two more months of intensive training before the first air fleet will be ready for action. This move is premature. Just a few more months and we can send it out as a devastating weapon. I fear we're committing the force in a plan which will dribble away its strength. I am no happier over the decision than you, Fuchida, replied Kakuta. However, I had no choice but to obey. I already have my orders. So, on 20 February, Kakuta ordered the first air fleet to the Marianas, headquarters at Tinian. Fuchida went with his flock, not the proud combat leader of a honed fighting instrument, as he had hoped and anticipated, but a seriously troubled man. He couldn't avoid the brutal fact that the naval general staff lacked the judgment and the courage to hold the line and buy time until the first air fleet could go into action at maximum efficiency. Spruance of Midway had won another major victory over Japanese naval air power without even knowing it. Fuchida had to make the best of a bad situation, and bad it was, for the air bases he had requested remained unfinished. He had expected that three on Saipan, three on Tinian, three on Guam, and one on Rota would be ready for use. Instead, there were only two incomplete bases on Tinian. The same situation existed on Saipan. Swift American advances were preventing construction from keeping pace with Japan's needs. Where would Fuchida's aircraft fit in? This was an immediate, unexpected problem. The bombers flew from Kyushu to Iwo Jima, thence to the Marianas. Stormy weather in the homeland held up arrival of the fighters at Kisarazu in east-central Honshu. From there, they flew to Iwo Jima. On the last stop, a typhoon delayed them again. As a result, the fighters arrived a week late, on 28 February. This seriously weakened the first air fleet in its initial days of action. In the meantime, Kakuta and Fuchida acted promptly. On the morning of the 22nd, the latter ordered reconnaissance aircraft on a search arc 300 miles to the east and south of Tinian. At about 15.30, the Admiral and Fuchida set out to investigate the second air base under construction on the island. While they surveyed the work and encouraged the engineers to speed it up, a car from headquarters swung up with a screech of brakes. The driver handed over a message from the scout plane. Enemy sighted. Force includes carriers. Kakuta and Fuchida hastened back to headquarters. On the way, they discussed what to do about the sighting. The enemy will probably attack soon, said Kakuta. Yes, most likely tomorrow, Fuchida agreed. It was their only point of agreement in this crisis. Kakuta wanted to strike at once. Fuchida admired him as a man of exceptional courage, but saw that prudence didn't temper his valour. Proud of his gallant war record, Kakuta thought only in terms of the attack. He was a wild pig warrior, as Fuchida would say. Fuchida himself had no illusions about the folly of sending half-ready bombers minus fighter escort against the deadly Spruance Mitcher team. Don't risk our forces unnecessarily, he entreated. Fly all the aircraft back to Japan at once, while they can still escape. Without fighters, the bombers have no cover. The bombers themselves have only just touched down from their long flight. Their crews aren't sufficiently rested to be thrown into battle. We can't face an all-out fight with the American task force. Kakuta didn't agree. To him, caution was cowardice. Each of these old friends felt a little disappointed in the other. Kakuta believed Fuchida was afraid to go out and fight, unless the odds were in his favour. 
Fuchida thought Kakuta lacked the common sense to order restraint in a situation where judgment should govern ardor. That night, under Kakuta's orders, about 27 torpedo planes took off under the lead of Furukawa, accompanied by nine night reconnaissance aircraft that sped ahead to find the US carrier force and lead the bombers to it. Back on Tinian, Kakuta and Fuchida waited anxiously for word. Finally, over the radio, they heard the attack signal. Two, to, two. Then silence. A few scout planes straggled back to report smoke and fire on the sea, but no tone of the bombers returned. There was no way to confirm the result of the attack. At dawn the next day, 23 February, more reconnaissance planes flew out in search of the Americans. Without waiting to receive any preliminary report, Kakuta insisted that Fuchida send off about 54 dive bombers, still lacking fighter cover. With grave misgivings, Fuchida obeyed orders. Every plane and man in this group was lost, some in attacking the American ships, the rest while attempting to return to Tinian. The US Navy completely controlled the air over the Marianas. Some 300 planes covered Mitch's big push of 23 February, and they destroyed not only Tinian's planes, but storage depots, houses and other buildings around the installation. In spite of the fearful punishment, Kakuta wanted to order Iwo Jima to send him as many of the first air fleet's fighters as had reached that point. Sheer madness in the circumstances, said Fuchida indignantly. This time Fuchida jettisoned both military decorum and his personal affection for Kakuta. It's absolutely stupid to bring the fighters down from Iwo, he told him vigorously. They'll come into the Marianas after a long flight, short on fuel and with their crews exhausted. And as only 27 fighters are on Iwo, there'll be no match for the Americans. The rest of the fighters haven't yet left the mainland. Kakuta admitted that Fuchida was right, but he was furious at the beating he had taken. He wanted the rest of the first air fleet's planes still in Japan, about two-thirds of the whole force, to take off immediately for the Marianas and engage the enemy. The Mitsha raid was a humiliating defeat for Japan, and a deadly punch to the already shaky first air fleet. Fuchida mourned the deaths of the men for whom he, under Kakuta, was responsible. The loss of Furukawa was a particular blow. Since before Pearl Harbor, Fuchida had relied heavily on his advice, expertise and cooperation. Now he needed such men to pass on their experience to the green pilots being sent to the first air fleet. Like any officer in wartime, Fuchida was prepared to buy results with men, but to lose them for nothing crushed his spirit, and he knew that the raid was only a token of more to come. Fuchida was not surprised when Koga personally ordered the remainder of the first air fleet to Saipan. Under the circumstances, this was the only sensible thing to do. The fleet had lost a third of its force. Additional training and aircraft were needed. Although Kakuta kept reconnaissance planes in the air all day to watch for an enemy fleet, Tinian was vulnerable because it had no radar. Nor could the Japanese launch night scouts. As a commander, Kakuta was a danger if left to himself on Tinian. Kakuta would have been A1 in the place of Nagumo at Peari Harbour or in place of Kurita at later Gulf, was Fuchida's judgment. But he was out of place in the Marianas in February 1944. That situation required a commander who was capable of retreat and flexible thinking. Following the Mitsha raids, Fuchida gave Kakuta his estimate of the situation. This is the first sign that the enemy will invade the Marianas in full force and soon, he said. The Americans will probably hit the Marianas another time or two to soften the defences further, then invade. But before that, they'll raid the Palaus. This made sense to Kakuta. The Palaus cut across one of Japan's routes to the Philippines or toward the Marianas, and Koga's having stationed his flagship Musashi there with important fleet units made the area a natural target. Fuchida sent extensive searches in that direction every day thenceforth. In the early evening of 28 March, one of the scouts reported three large groups of enemy ships proceeding toward Palau, including eight carriers escorted by battleships and destroyers. As Fuchida read this report, he was doubtful. Not too long ago he would have questioned such news as exaggerated, but not now. Now he thought there might well be ten or twelve carriers in this force, not just eight. Fuchida was correct. The three-pronged American force consisted of three carrier groups totaling 11 flat tops and a strong escort including the new battleship New Jersey, with Spruance aboard. 
Upon receiving an intelligence report, Koga moved his headquarters and staff ashore, ordering the Musashi, Takura and her escort ships to the north. It was none too soon. On 30th and 31st March, Spruance's fleet struck Palau like a typhoon. Then Yap, then Walei, on the 1st of April. Palau in particular provided a lesson in what it meant to be on the receiving end of a Spruance attack. Japan's naval air commander at Palau, Rear Admiral Munetako Sakamaki, a rated pilot and no mean opponent, reeled helplessly before the onslaught. Fuchida estimated that Spruance sent in 600 planes the first day of the attack. It was a powerful force, Fuchida explained, almost twice as many as we had in the Pearl Harbor attack. It showed how strongly the United States had developed its air arm. The Americans destroyed some 20 small ships, played havoc with the shore installations, and sowed mines that tied up the harbour and channel for 20 days. Fuchida estimated that the Japanese lost approximately 160 planes, virtually all they had in the Palau area at the time, against about 10 enemy aircraft. Post-war American figures cited 150 Japanese aircraft destroyed, 25 American, so Fuchida's guess was not too far out of line. The raids neutralised the Western Carolines, protected MacArthur's flank in New Guinea, left Palau an easy prey, and weakened Japan's naval air arm. This is really a licking, Ugaki, now commanding the 1st Battleship Division, wrote in his diary. Koga decided to pull his headquarters out and re-establish it at Davao. It couldn't be moved on either the 30th or 31st because of the heavy American encirclement, so Koga cabled Davao for some four-engine Kawanishis to pick up just him and his staff. Around midnight on the 31st, two flying boats, all Davao could spare, arrived and took off again with Koga and his staff. As Yamamoto had done, Koga divided his official family between the two aircraft to give him and his chief of staff, Fukudome, a double chance of getting through. The flight from Palau to Davao was normally three hours, an hour after takeoff, however, the two flying boats ran into a local typhoon with heavy rains. Fukudomi's pilot changed course, avoided the storm, and struggled as far as Cebu, where his aircraft crashed about two and a half miles offshore. Fukudome and several others survived the mishap, but guerrillas captured the party and hustled them off into the mountains. On 12 April, the third expeditionary fleet said that nine survivors, including Fukudome, had been rescued. The fate of Koga's aircraft remains a mystery to this day. The plane and all on board disappeared as completely as if they had flown out of the solar system. Fuchida and his fellow airmen thought it probable that Koga's pilot, an Etajima graduate noted for his personal courage, had pressed his luck too far by trying to ride out the typhoon. In any event, after a thorough search, the combined fleet had to accept the loss of another commander-in-chief. What rotten luck at a critical time like this! lamented Ugaki. It looks as if God is testing the Imperial Navy. The government kept Koga's death a secret from the public until the 5th of May 1944, slightly more than a month after the fact. In the meantime, his loss was admitted to a select group of Navy officers, together with the information that Vice Admiral Shiro Takasu had taken his place temporarily. Fuchida heard the sad truth fairly soon. In fact, he had the unpleasant task of breaking it to Kakuta. Koga's loss didn't deal either Japan or the Navy such a paralyzing blow as Yamamoto's had, but it was one in a series of shocks to be credited to Spruance. The parallel with the death of Yamamoto impressed itself on Fuchida. Here was history repeated in uncanny detail. The two aircraft, the divided staff, the loss of the commander-in-chief, the grave but not fatal downing of his chief of staff. And it brought personal grief to Fuchida. One of his closest friends had disappeared with Keiga, Commander Takeshi Naito, the Admiral's Air Operations Officer. Naito and Fuchida had been together in the same class at Kasumigara. Later, at the Naval Staff College, Naito formed one of the little group so ardently espousing air power. During the early part of the European War, he served as Assistant Naval Attaché in Berlin. In October 1941, when Fuchida was training his airmen in preparation for Pearl Harbor, Naito briefed him about the British aerial torpedo raid on the Italian ships at Taranto. Now he too was gone, like their friend and staff college classmate Muroi, 
who had perished at Ugaki's side on the day of Yamamoto's death. Fuchida wondered whether the parallel extended further. If Koga's cable to Davao had been intercepted and decoded, American aircraft could have been lurking in wait as they had been on 18 April 1943 when they shot down Yamamoto. However, no American accounts credit any US unit with downing Koga's aircraft. Either they leave the disaster unexplained or indicate that an accident took place. Thus, no conclusive evidence one way or the other has ever been forthcoming. By this time, Fuchida had developed definite ideas about US strategy. He fully realized that the Americans were moving in on Japan from two lines of approach, the MacArthur Drive through New Guinea toward the Philippines and the Nimitz Offensive through the Marianas. But of the two, Nimitz was by far the more dangerous, recalled Fuchida, because if he soon attacked the Marianas and captured them, the B-29 would come, it would strike at the heart of Japan, and then everything would be over. Of course, we wanted to protect both the Marianas and the Philippines, but Japan simply did not have the forces to protect both fronts at once, and of the two, the Marianas were far more important. Many key Japanese airmen knew about the new big bomber. However, not everyone in authority shared Fuchida's opinion. The Japanese couldn't leave MacArthur entirely to his own devices. Takasu came to the post of temporary commander-in-chief from the Southwest Area Fleet. Accustomed to thinking in terms of local problems, he continued to concentrate on MacArthur moving along the New Guinea coast. He estimated that the general's next target would be Biak Island, a strategic entry to the southern area that Japan could not afford to see cut off. So the Admiral ordered most of the first air fleet transferred to Halmahera Island in the East Indies, under his own command, to bolster that area's defence. He pulled about a hundred fighters and bombers out of Nimitz's path and sent them to the back street of nowhere. This development infuriated Fuchida. Japan urgently needed those forces and many more to counteract the expected Nimitz offensive against the Marianas. But he could only swallow his disapproval and comply with the transfer order. His fears turned out to be doubly justified. While waiting for MacArthur's strike against Humboldt Bay on the north-central coast of New Guinea, which came on 22nd April, many of the pilots at Halmahera contracted malaria. They had to be pulled out of the running before the race even started. Fuchida was not yet ready to concede total defeat, but his insistence upon the importance of the Marianas reveals the direction of his thoughts. Japan's objective had been the riches of Southeast Asia, and for a little while it held them. Every day these acquisitions were looking more and more expendable, and the homeland, without oil, tin, rubber or any of the commodities the Japanese had thought essential for their survival, began to appear more and more precious. Once more, 18 April rolled around. Again it proved a red-letter day in Fuchida's life, although he didn't know it at the time. That evening he had dinner and a discussion on Tinian with Kakuta and others of the 1st Air Fleet staff. Vice Admiral Seiichi Ito, Vice Chief of the Naval General Staff, and the indefatigable gender joined them. The two officers from Tokyo had recently been discussing the progress of the war with Nagumo, who in March arrived on Saipan as commander-in-chief of the Central Pacific and of the 14th Air Force. Nagumo was never one to look on the bright side. Now he really had something to be pessimistic about. They wanted to hear Kakuta's and Fuchida's opinion to get a rounded picture. The immediate trouble is at the very top, Fuchida declared without hesitation. A permanent commander-in-chief of the combined fleet must be appointed without delay, otherwise our naval leadership will deteriorate, and Takasu's headquarters is too removed from the heart of events which isn't very far from Japan. Something must be done along those lines, agreed Genda, with a swift glance at Ito. The next commander-in-chief may be Admiral Suimu Toyoda. Genda knew of another projected transfer that he didn't discuss with Fuchida. That very evening, Ito requested Kakuta to release Fuchida for duty as Toyoda's air operations officer. No one said anything to Fuchida about this until the appointment could be confirmed. They didn't want him to be let down in case it wasn't. Two days later, the message came from Tokyo. Fuchida appointed air operations officer of the combined fleet. The order directed him at once to Tokyo to discuss matters with his successor. So the next day, 21st April, he thumbed a hop on a land bomber to begin what was to be his final wartime duty assignment. 
At the Navy Ministry, he reported to the senior staff officer of the personnel section, who passed him along to the Air Department's senior staff officer. After being briefed, Fuchida was free to look around Tokyo. During one of Fuchida's visits, Haruko developed a mysterious illness. Overnight, one of her legs swelled to twice its normal size. Fuchida and the doctors feared that amputation would be necessary. At this prospect, Haruko balked. Rejecting surgery, she insisted upon injections with penicillin, then still in the experimental stage in Japan, and emerged from the ordeal with two healthy legs. In general, the Navy greeted Toyoda's appointment with approval. He had been commander of Yokosuka Naval Base, in itself an excellent preparation. Toyoda was a quiet type of man, but a man of strong character, Fuchida later described his chief. Perhaps he didn't have too much confidence in himself. He understood air operations reasonably well, but he didn't know how to lead them. Defeat is not only a matter of economics and material, it is a question of aggressive leadership. This would have saved the situation for us many times during the war. What we needed was a Halsey. What they got was a specialist in administration and logistics who had not one hour's combat experience in the current conflict. Fuchida didn't hold this against Toyoda, for he realised that Japan had almost reached the end of its resources. Naval operations now had to be planned on the basis of what was available. Toyoda knew every base and its capability, what the Navy could supply and build, and what it could not. With this background, Toyoda saw with painful clarity that Japan stood on the threshold of its destiny. Loss of the Marianas would mean the beginning of the end, and because as a logistician he understood the comparable industrial capacities of the United States and Japan, he had no confidence whatsoever that he could carry out his mission. But he was a courageous man and would do his best. Toyoda selected Kusaka as his chief of staff, so once more Fuchida had the privilege of serving under this fine gentleman. In a world of change, Kusaka remained as nearly unaltered and unalterable as the human condition permits. Through his Zen Buddhist discipline, he merged his will with the divine will. He faced life equally without passion and without reproach, accepting whatever came his way with courteous detachment. Fuchida discovered that in some respects his job as air officer was the key one of the staff. For all intents and purposes, the only really effective unit at sea was the mobile carrier force under Ozawa. Any staff work Fuchida completed would be significant for the fate of the Navy and ultimately of the homeland. He assumed, however, that his efforts would follow the chain of command. He would submit his work to the senior staff officer, who would buck it to the vice chief, then to Kusaka, and ultimately to Toyoda. By the time Toyoda received a plan or suggestion from Fuchida, it would embody the... This didn't prove to be the case. His papers went almost directly through Kusaka to Toyoda, virtually without change or amplification, and Toyoda, no airman, invariably accepted his ideas. While flattering to Fuchida, this situation placed a tremendous responsibility on the shoulders of a mere commander. It also reflected the supreme importance that had finally been attached to naval aviation, now that it was virtually too late to matter. Certainly it was too late for Fuchida to savour what should have been the climax of his career. At that time, the post of Air Operations Officer of the Combined Fleet was the most prestigious staff assignment open to a naval aviator. In anything like normal times, he would have taken pride and pleasure in his selection. Under the circumstances, however, he held the position without the means to use it constructively. It was like finding a million yen notes on a desert island. What could a man do with them except light fires? Visitor strolling into a Japanese officers' club early in 1944 might have seen a little knot of naval brass lifting glasses with a ringing campes, the equivalent of bottoms up. In this manner, the men saluted each oil tanker from Southeast Asia that had run the gauntlet of American submarines to reach the oil centre at Yokoyama, near the western end of the Inland Sea. The steel sharks sank so many tankers that any oiler coming safely through the Straits of Shimonoseki richly earned the toast. If the surface fleet had remained in home waters, it would have been cancelled out as an effective force before ever meeting the enemy. As the oil could not come to the ships, the ships had to go to the oil. So in February, Toyoda sent most of them to linger roads at Singapore. For once, Fuchida did not object to moving the vessels so far from the Nimitz line, 
Conventional forces, however formidable, would be worthless without command of the air. Toyoda remained in his headquarters in Tokyo's Akasaka Palace, or occasionally in the light cruiser Oyoda in the Inland Sea or Tokyo Bay. His staff officers stayed at his side. In some respects, the combined fleet organization now resembled its American counterpart. Toyoda was comparable to Nimitz, Admiral Shigetaro Shimada, chief of the naval general staff, to Admiral Ernest J. King. Ozawa, who had been in command of the carriers and their screen, took over practically all surface ships. His nearest American equivalent at the time was Spruance. Of the nine carriers remaining to Japan, only three, the Shokaku and Zukaku, both the worse for wear and having undergone extensive repairs, and the new Jaiho, completed on the 7th of March 1944, really deserved the name of carrier. The painful shortage of skilled pilots continued. Most of the veteran flight personnel had perished. About this time, 500 pilots and a like number of radio operators emerged from Kasumigara, candidates for carrier assignments. These fledglings of 18 to 20 years old normally would have received further training in the home islands, but scarcely any gas remained for training purposes, so they and their instructors had to go directly to the Third Fleet and train at sea under Ozawa. Through no fault of his own, Ozawa was unable to give them the on-the-spot training they needed. The fleet had moved to Tawi-Tawi, western most of the Sulu Islands. Not only were Tawi-Tawi's airfields still incomplete, but, in the words of Captain Toshikazu Ohmae, senior staff officer of the 1st Mobile Fleet, it was practically impossible for carriers to go out of the anchorage for the training of the airmen because of the threat of enemy submarines. Fuchida arranged for the immediate return of the 1st Air Fleet's planes from Halmahera to the Marianas. It was the only thing the Japanese could do. A mere handful of the more than 100 pilots remained fit for duty. The rest had malaria and would be out of action for months. For Fuchida, this particular misfortune was almost the last straw. Japan's other disasters of the past year, the loss of Yamamoto, then Koga, steady American progress through the Pacific Islands, the resurgence of MacArthur, and the attrition of Japan's shipping were the fortunes of war. A malaria bug cancelling out so many fine airmen fell into the category lawyers call acts of God. With the grim statistics in his hands, Fushida began to see an almost mystical thread of fatality running through the dark tapestry of Japan's misfortunes. God is not on our side, he thought bleakly. But he wouldn't shirk his job. If only his airmen could catch the American carriers before they reached the Marianas. Where would Spruance go following his April raids? He estimated that the Admiral would take his fleet to the huge harbour of Majuro Island in the Marshalls. A surprise attack there might pay off. Sinking eight or ten American flat tops would put a serious dent in Nimitz's plan to invade the Marianas. To that end, all through May, Fuchida worked on a plan he named Jan Sakusen, Red Heart Operation. He determined to head the attack force himself. Toyoda and Kusaka agreed to this reluctantly. Both admirals valued him as a colleague, and an attack with such limping naval air forces as were at his disposal virtually guaranteed his death but he insisted on his duty and right to lead his men, and they could not deny the logic. Toward the end of May, events diverted their attention. On Saturday the 27th, MacArthur's forces landed on Biak in the Shoten Islands off New Guinea. Biak was important to Japan. If the Americans built airstrips there, it would be difficult for the Japanese to maintain their own on the western end of New Guinea. Palau would be within American striking range, so Ugaki estimated... Movements of the task force east of Mindanao will be impossible. Finally, Operation A, that is, the naval Armageddon, will be made impracticable. Toyoda and Kusaka inclined toward Ugaki's serious view. In fact, they wondered if the Biak invasion heralded the principal American thrust against Japan. Fuchida thought not. The main invasion will come in the Marianas, he said, because Nimitz has the bulk of US sea and air power, and these two factors will dictate his major advance. Neither Toyoda nor Kusaka agreed completely. They rather expected Nimitz to order his fleet to Biak in support of MacArthur. Fuchida remained positive that every available Japanese naval force should concentrate in the Marianas to prepare for Operation A, and kept hammering away at that point. They should forget MacArthur, and acknowledge that they couldn't hold Biak 
or indeed most of the outlying points, they should abandon them without wasting time, fuel and men. If Nimitz breached their defences in the Marianas, he would cut their lifeline, and they would lose their outposts anyway, whether MacArthur invaded them or not. Japanese troops on Biak put up a fierce resistance. Toyoda decided to bombard the enemy's footholds and to help the army by transporting about 2,500 troops from Zamboanga in the Philippines to Biak. This, the Japanese named Operation Con. After two false starts using destroyers, Toyoda called in his first team, the monster battleships Yamato and Musashi, to sortie from the anchorage at Tawi Tawi and bomb Biak at night. On 10 June, the battle wagons and their escorts set out under Ugaki's command. Because these ships had no carrier cover, the Navy sent up what planes remained in the Halmahera area to provide air support. When the ships had steamed to within 200 miles of Biak, a United States reconnaissance plane spotted them, and Ugaki's air cover saw the American scout. When this news reached headquarters, Toyoda's senior staff officer, Captain Fujita, recommended that since Japan had lost surprise, they should call off the expedition. Toyoda agreed. On 13 June, he sent the word to Ugaki, who pulled back accordingly. This development aroused mixed feelings in Fuchida, who had opposed Operation Con from the start. I never wanted any of the fleet sent to Biak, he later explained. I wanted to bring all available forces to the Marianas when the time came and there fight the great all-out battle. However, once we launched Con and the battleships reached within 200 miles of the target, I believed they might as well go through with it and inflict what damage they could on MacArthur's troops rather than waste the trip. So he fumed when Toyoda and Fugita got cold feet. In this opinion, he was one with gender in general headquarters who knew about the scheme and was sorely displeased that it fizzled out so ignobly. While Con was underway, the Allies began the invasion of Normandy. There was a general realisation in the Japanese Navy that this was very dangerous for Germany. Like many Japanese, Fuchida had pinned his faith on the Axis partnership. If Germany won in Europe, Japan might well be victorious in Asia. Now no possibility remained of a Nazi victory nor did Fuchida harbour hopes of Hitler holding off the Allies. Long, hard fighting awaited the Allies in Europe, but Fuchida felt certain of the end. About this time, Fuchida returned to his own brainchild, Operation Jan. Before firming up plans or taking action, the Japanese would have to survey Majuro Harbour, a project Fuchida entrusted to his good friend and veteran reconnaissance expert, Commander Takahiko Chihaya. He directed two scout planes, Japan's newest and best, to take off on the 3rd of June from Tinian, go to Truk for refueling, and thence proceed to the small isolated island of Nauru, where Japan maintained fuel supplies. Chihaya joined these scouts on the 4th of June. That night he flew to Majuro, timing himself to arrive on the 5th at dawn, the hour of the proposed attack. Beneath him lay a sight to make any Japanese bombardier lick his chops, at least twelve carriers, four of them quite small, with their escort ships. Chihaya took pictures of this magnificent array, then flew back to Truk to save fuel. Even so, he cut it fine, touching down with a bare minimum of gas. After refueling, he hastened to Tinian to have his photographs developed and sent to Fuchida. This evidence removed all doubt as to the advisability of Jan. Fuchida planned to lead 27 torpedo planes. Igusa would head a like number of dive bombers. They established an approach route from Kisarazu to Marcus Island, on to Wake, and thence to Majuro. Fuchida arranged for a last-minute reconnaissance. It so happened, however, that an American bombing mission hit the Truk fields on the very date Chihaya was scheduled to make this check. Fuchida postponed the operation for a few days. Chihaya scouted Majuro again on the 9th of June, flying from Truk to Majuro, back to Nauru, and home to Truk. On this mission he had no luck at all. Apparently the whole American fleet had sorted. Great was the puzzlement in combined fleet headquarters at this news. Where were Spruance's forces? Nobody had any firm answers. That ended Operation Red Heart, a mission that almost surely would have been curtains for Fuchida, among others. Foiled in this scheme, the combined fleet staff returned with renewed vigour to their planning for the defence of the Marianas, the battle plan called Eigo, which, according to Fuchida, originated with Ome. The Japanese would lure the American fleet south of Palau, Yap and Wolai, and there join battle. 
Every available warship would participate, including the nine carriers, protected by submarines and land-based planes. Fuchida worked on the preparations for Operation A with all his customary vigour, but not with any view to victory in the Pacific. A full concentration of Japanese forces in the Marianas might succeed in sinking a good portion of Nimitz's fleet. If this could be done, there would be a good opportunity for a compromise peace with the United States. But if the Japanese couldn't hold off the Americans there, that was the end of Japan. He doubted the plan's chance of success. Ozawa's pilots were still green and the battle plan overextended them. Moreover, fond as Fuchida was of Ozawa, he doubted his leadership qualities. On 15 June, US forces commenced landing on Saipan, and Toyoda activated AA with a grandiloquent message. The combined fleet will destroy the enemy task force which has come to the Marianas area, then annihilate its invasion force. That is not the way matters turned out. The Japanese plan called for close cooperation between Ozawa's carriers and Kakuta's first air fleet covering the Marianas, Carolines, Iwo Jima and Truk. But Ozawa held off sortie until the last possible moment and had to refuel, which cost him precious time. As he moved toward the scene of action, installations in the Marianas took a terrific beating from aerial strikes and battleship bombardment. By the time Ozawa reached a position to do battle, the first air fleet had been knocked out as a force in being. With Japan's plan for coordinated air effort shot to pieces, Spruance could face Ozawa undistracted. Possessed of his customary cool prudence, he held off attack until he had the chance to clear the air. Ozawa sent a full-scale strike against the American carriers, only to run into a hornet's nest of Hellcats and anti-aircraft fire. In these first attacks, he lost most of his aircraft and inflicted little damage on the Americans, just when the crews of Ozawa's carriers were congratulating themselves that the Americans either had not discovered them or dared not attack, disaster struck from below. The submarine Albacore slammed a torpedo into the brand new flagship Taiho. The actual hit had little effect on the sturdy carrier, but gas vapours began seeping through the ship, so Ozawa transferred his flag to the cruiser Naguro. Less than two hours later, a terrible explosion shattered the Taiho. She sank at 1640. Within two hours, the submarine Kavala sent four torpedoes into the Shikaku, which blew up later the same day. Misfortune continued to dog Ozawa on the morrow, commencing with a night attack. Spruance took the air offensive, sinking the Hio and Twat anchors full of precious fuel. Heavy damage was inflicted on the Zuikaku, Junyo, Ryujo and Chioda, on the battleship Haruna, and on yet another tanker. The Americans called the air action of 19 June 1944 the Marianas Turkey Shoot, an inelegant but accurate title. By the night of 20 June, when the Battle of the Philippine Sea ended, Ozawa had lost 395 of his 430 carrier aircraft. One fact may best summarize Japan's frustration. In the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the United States lost more aircraft in launching accidents than by Japanese action. Back on the flagship, listening to the inexorable score of Japanese losses, Fuchida heard the drums of defeat beating in his ears. He was not unduly dejected, for he had expected some such result. On the personal front, however, he had to face a series of stunning griefs. They made the Marianas campaign, particularly the action on and around Saipan, the most tragic days of his life since Midway. Among those who perished in defence of Saipan were two of his closest Etajima shipmates, Taketora Uyoda and Terujiro Urata. They had been members of the, the small coterie that included Fuchida, Genda and Suzuki. Chihaya, too, peerless scout and observer, met his fate over Saipan. Fuchida had worked long and harmoniously with Chihaya. The loss made him feel as though he had lost some of his sight. Worst of all, if one such bereavement can be more cruel than another, was the loss of Egusa, Fuchida's closest Pearl Harbor comrade. He remembered their jailbreak from Yokosuka Hospital after Midway, the steadfast stalwart Egusa carrying him out on his back. And in that same terrible July, Fuchida lost another Pearl Harbor veteran. In death, as in life, Itaya was different. He fell in the Kuriles, a victim of Japanese anti-aircraft gunners who mistook his plane for an enemy's. Fuchida and Itaya had never been cronies, but the fighter ace's death shook him. 
Of that select group who led the major segments of the Pearl Harbor airstrike, only Fuchida and Shimazaki remained. Also lost were two commanders under whose flags Fuchida had served long and well. Nagumo perished on Saipan, committing suicide when he saw defeat staring him in the face. On Tinian, Kakuta perished with every member of the 1st Air Fleet staff, whether by suicide or enemy action is not known. Had Fuchida still been with Kakuta, he would have been in the forefront of the action, and possibly one of the first to die. Others more highly placed than Fuchida shared his belief that the summer of 1944, in particular the Saipan campaign, marked a turning point in Japan's fortunes. The loss of Saipan made a profound change in the prospect of the war situation, recalled General Shigeru Hasunuma, chief aide-de-camp to the emperor. It seemed to me that at the time many of the intelligent Japanese felt that efforts should be made to terminate the war rather than continue a struggle which held no hope of victory. In a democracy, such opinions would have surfaced rapidly and found spokesmen. No such development was possible in Japan. Suggestions for peace had to be whispered, exchanged by the most subtle of hints between the most trusted of friends. Marquis Koichi Kido, Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, testified that as early as autumn 1943, four of the elder statesmen, Reijiro Wakatsuki, Admiral Keisuke Okada, Kichiro Hiranuma and Prince Fumimaro Konoye, began to discuss ways to terminate the war. Kido was in touch with this group and occasionally expressed his opinions. Around May of 1944, Okada called on Premier Tojo to attempt to convey to him the views of the elder statesmen. However, the Premier accused these men of plotting the overthrow of the cabinet and the interview was broken off abruptly. At the time, Tojo was in a highly nervous condition and made extensive use of the military police for political purposes. The Kempeitai constantly tailed Konoya and had Kido's official and personal residences under surveillance. And so the men working for an end to the war mutually exercised the highest degree of caution, since any mention of peace would automatically mean the collapse of the peace movement. But the Tojo regime couldn't survive the disasters that followed one upon the other in the summer of 1944. The emperor summoned General Kunyaki Koiso from Korea to replace Tojo. Koiso was not happy, but as a loyal subject he had no choice. Hirohito received Koiso in joint audience with Admiral Mitsumasa Yonai and charged them, The two of you, in cooperation with each other, will form a cabinet and will particularly put forth efforts to attain the objective of the Great East Asian War. Further, you must be careful not to irritate the Soviet Union. Koiso interpreted this as an order to destroy the United States and Great Britain and to accomplish our objective, to construct a Great East Asia. Yet the presence beside him of Yonai, with orders to form a coalition cabinet with him, Deg should have conveyed its own message. A former premier, the friend and sponsor of Yamamoto, Yonai ranked as a moderate politically. During his tenure, he had firmly opposed trouble with the United States. Marquis Yasumasa Matsudera, chief secretary to Kido, had no doubt of the admiral's significance. Admiral Yonai was chosen because he had the trust of the emperor, and also because the emperor knew that he entertained thoughts of peace. Few in Japan understood the nature and extent of the crisis. The armed forces had fed the government-controlled press a diet of boastful misinformation that was duly served up to the public. Most people didn't realize that Japan was losing the war. Not even Koiso and his high-ranking colleagues in Korea knew that the armed forces were incurring heavy losses. The government believed that if it sued for peace, internal disorders would shake the country. After all, when the Treaty of Portsmouth ended the Russo-Japanese War, indignant citizens had set fire to the Diet Building. Hunched over his desk, heart sore, disturbed, confused, Fuchida presented microcosm of the national dichotomy. His common sense told him that the only thing to do was sue for peace before the full fury of war fell on the homeland. On the other hand, Japanese fighting men were conditioned from earliest manhood not to surrender. Fuchida's brain said, make peace. His instinct countered, never, fight to the end. When he thought of the fierce resistance the Japanese put up in the islands, he was proud. But when he remembered his dead comrades, he grieved that his nation persisted in continuing a hopeless conflict that would demand the sacrifice of many more valuable lives, it was well for his sanity that his job kept him too busy to brood.
With the close of the Marianas campaign, the Japanese entered a new stage of the conflict. They had enjoyed a brief fling on the offensive, then began a long period of gradual pullback. Now the Navy embarked upon a strategy of desperation exemplified in two major projects, Operation Show and the special attack concept of suicide weapons. Fuchida's introduction to the latter came early in July 1944. At that time, Captain Aikiro Joe submitted a petition to his commander, Ozawa, who endorsed it and sent it up to Toyoda, who in turn passed it down for Fuchida's comments. Joe called for a force of suicide pilots to be sent on missions that would strike a telling blow for the Empire. Fuchida knew Joe well. He had served as assistant naval attaché in Washington, and at the time of Pearl Harbor was an aide to the Emperor.